Now, coming to the next slide thrombophlebitis and bed sores. This is another uh, important audit which can be done in the hospitals for the bed sores. Either you can follow Braden scale or a push scale, where uh, you can have an audit uh, and clear about the thrombophlebitis and bed sores. Why I am talking uh, particularly about thrombophlebitis here is that many of the thrombophlebitis can be due to drug induced, like your hypotonic salines, your cardarone, even the potassium supplements can cause severe thrombophlebitis. So, whenever you are recording the thrombophlebitis, make sure that whether the thrombophlebitis is uh, due to the infection or uh, it is due some to some other factors like drug induced. Coming to the next slide now, if you see here the IV infusion protocol and bed sore audit checklist, again you are right going to write the date observations and the patient details and when the patient got admitted in the hospital. This will give you a brief data about your IV lines, whether it is a peripheral line or a central line and also about the bed sores in the patients. The next slide, if you see here the thrombophlebitis and bed sores analysis form. Again, this is very, very important. Each and everything has to be documented, whatever you do in the infection prevention and control. Even if you ask me, simple preparation of the disinfectant for cleaning the high risk areas or the OTs or the ICU is important for us. Because if the staff is not aware of the proper dilution, proper concentration, proper chemical to be used at what chemical has to be used to kill the organisms, what they are targeting and if there is no contact time has been given, then your exercise will be a waste of time and it is a waste of resources in the hospital. So, each and everything has to be documented policy in the form of policy, make sure the top management is involved in this and then you can implement at the different uh, end user levels in the different sections in the hospitals. Coming to this uh, thrombophlebitis and bed source analysis form, again it has the patient details, name of the patient and date of admission and the date of discharge, thrombophlebitis suppose if it has been identified, which date it has been identified, whether the patient is on any drugs which can cause thrombophlebitis or if the patient is on any antibiotics and IV fluids all that thing can be recorded in this. The next slide, uh, if you see here again the continuation of that, the symptoms, the grades of the thrombophlebitis, whether the grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, this all details you can get on the net where you can have a grade 1 where only the pain is there, where the grade 2 pain and swelling, grade 3 the cord, cord becomes palpable and thick and grade 4 where all the things will be present and apart from this the patient may have a signs and symptoms of sepsis. So, this has to be documented in proper about the thrombophlebitis and make sure that what type of phlebitis you are dealing with, whether it is an infectious cause or it is a non-infectious cause. The next slide about the analysis form uh, of the bed source, again in this you can follow the push scale or Braden scale, where uh, this has been again divided into the grades uh, like grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 and grade 4, based on the redness, blister formations and uh, infection being getting little bit deep involving the skin and subcutaneous tissue and it is getting more involving the organs. So, again this is a pro forma where uh, you can record and uh, classify your bed source based on the grading either from the push scale or a Braden scale. If you see in the next slide now, needle stick injury reporting form. Why I have kept the needle stick injury reporting form in prevention of uh, hospital acquired infections? Believe me, this is also a very, very important cause of the healthcare providers getting positive with HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. I have seen many nursing staff and doctors getting infected with pulmonary tuberculosis and extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Many doctors getting infected and even the nurses in the hostels getting infected with varicella herpes zoster varicella pneumonias, H1N1. We have come across some of the hospital staff getting infected with H1N1 after taking care of the patients with H1N1. So, this is a very, very important part. Prevention is very important. Prevention at the patient level, prevention at the healthcare provider level, prevention at the patient attendance level, prevention at the community level. Every part and every step is important everywhere the prevention bundle checklist has to be in place and make sure the things get implemented. And you believe me, if you have a proper prevention checklist in the hospital, many of the hospital acquired infections can be curtailed and it can bring, bring into the control. Coming to the needle stick injury reporting form, if you see in the next slide, this is the protocol like where when anyone comes across healthcare provider or a patient or patient, patient attendants with a needle stick injury, you have to inform, do not hide the incidents needle stick injuries should not be hidden. It should be bringing into the notice of infection control department, infection control officer to take care of the immediate precautions what best we can do. Needle stick injury itself is a very big topic, we cannot go in detail right now, but in short I can tell 
that hepatitis B surface antigen which we tell hepatitis B virus, it can stay on the environment for 5 to 6 days if it does not get exposed to the chemicals or the sunlight at the room temperature. HBSAG and HCV is very infectious and it has to take care have to take vaccinations for that for hepatitis B which is available now and HIV and HCV again uh, what best we can do is taking through personal protective equipment and following the barrier protocols to avoid injuries. If anyone comes across, in, across a needle stick injury it has to be reported and immediate subsequent actions has to be taken. Coming to the next slide now about the reintubation checklist again it is an important part in the prevention of infection. More the patient gets reintubated, more the chances of patient getting trapped into the hospital acquired pathogens, MDR pathogens especially as intrabacter and, and pseudomonas. So, we need to maintain the reintubation checklist in the hospital to find out how many of the patients are getting reintubated within 48 hours of extubation. Many of the hospitals they have to keep this because if the reextubation uh, reintubation has to be done after extubation within 48 hours, either the extubation checklist has not been followed properly or the doctors or anesthetist or a pulmonologist decision to extubate the patient may not be may be wrong. Because in very few of the cases we come across where everything was in place, but because just simply because the patient got deteriorated due to the illness they have to be reintubated. That is okay, that is acceptable, but re we are talking about those reintubations which has been done within 48 hours of extubation due to improper judging the patient for extubation. I am talking about those cases. So, in this we need to maintain the checklist. This is the checklist again the patient details date of intubation and uh, date of extubation. If you see the further in the next slide now, where again after the date of extubation, when the patient is been getting reintubated is again it is very very important. If you see in the, in the next slide, the extubation date has to be documented and reintubation within 48 hours, it, this has to be bring into the notice of the infection control department and the management. So, that if any lacuna is happening in understanding the extubation criteria or the implementation of that it can be corrected immediately. So, this is how the prevention goes for all the hospital acquired infections. In conclusion, uh, I would like to say here is that if you talk about the prevention of hospital acquired infection, first thing we should come into your mind is following religiously hand, hand wash and hand hygiene practices in the hospital. Religiously you have to follow, make sure every person in the hospital follow the hand hygiene. It is not only for the doctors or the nurses, but also for the housekeeping staff and also for the patient attendants and the visitors. Second important thing comes is about the checklist. Make sure your checklist should be a real checklist. It is not simply a tick list, where it has been ticked at the end of the day and forwarded the pro forma to the infection control department. Third important thing which you ask me is the education education of the staff about the prevention aspect, it is very, very important. Everyone should be educated how the infections can be prevented. And the fourth about the bringing the awareness in the healthcare staff about the prevention, not only in the healthcare staff, but in the patient attendants and the patient visitors, everyone about the education, about the awareness about the what best they can do at the community level to avoid the infections getting prevented, the prevention at the community level. And the last important thing which I would like to say here is your engineering control, environmental control in the operation theatres and your policies in the operation theatres related to the implementation of your checklist and also the zoning of the operation theatre which is very, very important. The that is plays a major role and many factors which plays an important role in surgical site infections apart from that uh, like opening of the I told. Uh, the mobilization of the traffic in the operation theatre is also an important aspect, where we someone can do audit on that also. So, this is how uh, we should follow up with the preventive prevention checklist and uh, if it is being implemented properly uh, with the help of the top management, I am sure okay, we could able to come out with the meanness of this hospital acquired infections and our high rate can come down and we can bring down it to a significant level. That is how we can bring down the meanness of hospital acquired infections uh, and if we implement the practices properly in the hospital, I am sure we can bring down the significantly the high rates can come down in the hospitals. Thank you.